Hey, I got Jeff Ailing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I've known you for how long? Twenty years. Twenty years. years. See, that's what happens. You know, you you say, "Oh, I'll do this (laughs) little art gallery," and then all of a sudden, twenty years goes by, and you have. I remember you had jet black hair. No, I've never had jet, jet black hair. Jet brown hair. Jet brown hair. <laughs> I don't know, but I know there was no gray in it. Yeah, well. And I had no I like to think of myself hair. as beautifully blonde. <laughs> you know, you got great hair at least, yeah. Yeah, at least I got hair. Yeah, I know. Well, uh, next, the next 20 years when we meet, it probably won't be that. Well, you never know. My grandpa kept his. It, yeah, right well, you will. Yeah. yeah, but this one will be. Oh, yeah. well. I'm, it's going quick. I mean, my dad had no hair. So. Yeah, let's go. What's, what's left is still stylish. <laughs> That's good. I'm keeping it looking young. Um, so Jeff came in here today, which is great, because we're doing a wonderful show on his cloud paintings and landscape paintings and... But I want to find out a lot about Jeff. Now, I've known him for 20 years, but I don't really know the whole story other than what, you know, you know, the Kansas Art Institute and things, but where you trained at. But I want to know kind of the history, the, the backstory. Yeah. And I know you're like an army brat, right? Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, I was born in Iowa City, Iowa. My dad was going to medical school at uh, University of Iowa. And... Uh, Immediately after graduating from medical school, he entered the army. And so you were born when he was still in medical school. Yeah. And what did your mom do? She was a dental hygienist. Oh yeah, very interesting. Yes. And did they meet in that environment? No, they met uh, when my dad was in junior college, getting oh, his associate's degree. I see. So she followed him to Iowa City. Yeah, they got married, and right before he entered medical school. Yeah. That's how and it always I was. Sh- back then, then I showed up a year later. <laughs> uh, I got in just under the wire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was important in Iowa City. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Exactly. There you go. And so when he so he finished medical school in in Iowa, and then he went directly into the army. What yeah. What year would have this been? He was doing his internship. We did that in uh, God, where Fort Benning, Georgia. Mm-hmm. And at the end of that, uh, they sent him for Army flight training. So this is like 61? Yes, it's really early 60s, yes. Yeah, yeah like so we're 61. not really into Vietnam yet. Well, we were, not but, yet, that, but not coming out not officially. It, yeah. So did, why, why did he go into the military? Was that he to pay for school, or he just said, no, I'm just going to do my thing? Part of it was... Uh, he had thought that he was going to go into dermatology, mm. and they had a really good derm program yeah. in the army. Yeah, they do. And uh, also that you know it was going to cover a lot of his expenses because yeah. I mean they were I understand. they I were there. poor, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they he went through his internship in Fort Benning, Georgia, and then they sent him out for army flight training at Pensacola. And taught him how to fly airplanes in preparation for mm. moving to Germany, mm. and uh, that was right after the Berlin Wall went up. Mm. And he went over six months ahead of us. You know, they were doing gigantic military maneuvers in uh, West Germany at that point because everyone was paranoid that the yeah. Russians were going to come this down is like the corridor. Sixty-three-ish. Yeah. 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 And uh, he did that for six months, and then we moved over, and he uh, was working at the hospital in Landstuhl, which is still the big, you know, in the European theater, it's still the big hospital that everybody goes to. Everybody that's wounded in Iraq or Mm -hmm. Afghanistan generally ends up in Landstuhl. Yeah, Yeah. 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 I knew that. And so did you have, you have a couple brothers and a sister, or when did they come into play? Oh, uh, my brother David, who is the one under me, is, was born in Fort Benning. My sister was born in Germany, and I have another brother, Mark, that was born in uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah, so you guys kept zipping around. Yeah, yeah. So he was doing flight surgery. He was a he flight was, surgeon. He was a flight surgeon, yeah. Yep. And he did that for how long? Because he went back and did get that dermatology. Yeah, degree, he right? did that for uh, three years. <laughs> And then he got accepted uh, to go to Walter Reed and do his uh, residency in, in dermatology DC. at Walter Reed. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. 
And was. then we moved from Washington, D.C. to Hawaii in 1968. Mm. And he was at Tripler for three years, and then he moved. We moved to Denver. So in 68, let's see, you would have been about nine? 68, I would have been nine going on 10. Yeah, yeah and you were there for three years? Yeah, we were there during the big riots, actually. Yeah, what, now tell me about riot. those. Uh, you know, the awareness of that stuff, uh, what I remember about it, it's, it was, you know, bulletins coming on the TV that Martin Luther King had been assassinated, right. and then immediately stuff started happening in Washington. It was, it got really bad. You know, about a third of downtown D.C. burned yeah. down. It yeah. was a big mess. And, uh, you know, it was on the TV, all the networks. I mean, it was a big deal. There was riots nationwide, but D.C. was particularly bad. Do you think that affected you? In, in oh, a, yeah, I absolutely. Mean, so to, to, in the way that well, you developed from that Yeah, you on? know, it's, it's in younger years, like we were in Pensacola during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. And I was only dimly aware of what was going on. I knew that my parents were really freaked out because my dad right. got called in. Right. And uh, they were turning us all, you know, everybody had been put on alert. My dad had to go in. They shut down the, the naval base and the army base. Wow. And, you know, they were freaked out because Pensacola is close yeah, to you, Cuba. Yeah. yeah, your mom must have been really f flipped out. Yeah. Whether you're young and don't know it or not, you could feel it. Yeah, you like feel animal, it. You know? uh, the stuff in D.C. in 68, though, I was definitely aware of it. Yeah. And, you know, it was frightening. We lived out in, the, we lived in Silver Spring, you know, but uh, it was, you know, you'd watch the TV and, you know, just block after block after block of buildings on fire. It was really something. Yeah, I remember those days, because we were, we're similar age in New Mexico. With, we had, you know, small town, but we still had riots. There were still problems. Yeah, and then, you know, when Robert Kennedy was assassinated, you know, shortly thereafter, I think it was June 5th or something yeah. like that. And yeah, I remember thinking distinctly, you know, the everything's just going crazy yeah. you know world's gonna end yeah absolutely you have that kind of feeling and then you know being military bright you're aware of that stuff you know when we lived in hawaii uh we lived at Schofield barracks and there's a pass through the mountains at Schofield called coley coley pass and you can go right through that pass over the wainai range and on the other side of it was the weapons depot for the Pacific Fleet. And where, where is that? Which island? That's on Oahu. Yeah, that's what I yeah. thought. Okay. And so you were, when you got there, was it just at the beginning of like 69? It was, uh, it was August of 68. Oh, yeah, it was August of 68. Yeah. Your parents were probably happy to get out of D.C. at that point. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you were there four years? Uh, three years. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that was super formative, I know. And so Oh, yeah. There's, that was a big, big deal. You know, we, uh, I got really interested in surfing and uh, just the ocean in general, which is funny because I could barely swim when I got mm -hmm. there. Our parents hooked us up with swimming lessons, and yeah, you know, the first few times I paddled out on a board, I had one of those floaty belts on. <laughs> <laughs> ah, too bad there's no photos of that oh, out there. Just, oh, there's plenty of embarrassing photos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so you learned how, and I know you're a big surfer, you still surf to this day, but so those from 10 to 13, you were really involved in that surfer scene kind of thing? Well, on our block, uh, right down the street from me, there was a family, the Owenses. And their oldest son, Bobby, who is a good friend of mine, was an incredible surfer, even when he was really young. And he ended up, you know, going, being professional. He was oh, yeah. really, really, He's really good. good. And yeah. you would go surf with him? Yeah, all the time. Oh, wow. That makes you good fast. But uh, the, the main family was on the block behind ours, uh, Colonel, Colonel Al Albert Benson. They called him just the Colonel. 
But he was one of the best known surf photographers on Oahu at that time and also shot 16 millimeter movie footage. So any of the stuff you see from that era that's shot on, you know, film, mm. he was responsible for most of that. And for some reason, he did PR for Tripler Medical Center, and they let him stay in that job for like nine years, which in the Army is yeah. unheard of. Yeah, because usually you get a duty station. Then you, yeah, you usually it's every three gone. three years you're out, but... Uh, to keep him in, they just let him stay. Oh, he's so and, good. Uh, yeah, he was really good at his job. Very personable, nice guy, but a big family and all surfers. And uh, they were right down the street from us. And everybody who was involved in you know the highest levels of, of surfing in Hawaii was through that house at one time or another. And where were you surfing? What beaches would you man, surf at? Well, I learned how to surf at Barber's Point Naval Air Station, mm -hmm. which is uh, on the South Shore. Mm -hmm. And it's notorious for being pretty much a weak, crumbly wave. It, it sometimes gets good in the summertime. Good place to learn. Yeah. And we surfed a lot at Waianae uh, at the beach camp. Uh, they, it's on the west side of Oahu, just south of Makaha. And back then you could rent cabins. So our families, those three <laughs> families, rented cabins over there all the time. So we surfed a lot at Waianae and at Makaha. And, uh, you ever think about who you were out there surfing when Obama might have been there too? You know, I have no idea. He was a town kid. Yeah, he was. He lived in Honolulu. He surfed, I think, at Waikiki. Yeah. I, uh, you know, back then nobody would have been aware of him. And, uh, yeah, I have. I know a lot of people over there, but I don't know anybody that really had much contact with him. Yeah. I think he was more of a student basketball yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. I think he can body surf though. Yeah, yeah. we've seen him body. <laughs> yeah, he's not bad. Yeah, yeah, he's okay. And so, you did you get pretty serious with your serving in that period of time? In three years, you're not going to get very good. No. I mean, I was competent, uh, and. With surfing, all it takes is competent to get, you'll get completely hooked on it. There's yeah. nothing like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, I didn't surf again for a long time after that. You know, we moved to Denver and I started skiing. <laughs> you took up another sport, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so when you were doing all this, had you started doing anything related with art at this point? You know, really, the first art stuff that I started doing was when I was in third grade. I got interested in it, just in drawing. And, uh, you know, third through fifth grade, I drew all the time. You know, Same but, with Howard Post, by the way, yeah. third grade for him. Yeah, but, you know, kid drawings, you know, nothing. But drawing all the time. Yeah, drawing all the time. And I had a real fascination. My parents uh, gave me that Time Life series, uh, science series books and in those books you'd get these cutaway views like I had one on ships mm -hmm. I remember those and it had you know a, a big cruise liner cut in half you know so that you could see inside of it and that's the kind of drawings that I like to do kind of three-dimensional thing well <laughs> <laughs> they were pretty rud rudimentary you know they were definitely 2d yeah. but uh, huh? you know I loved the idea of cutting a thing in half and uh you know, draw, drawing everything that was going on in all the compartments. But, uh, it's funny that you asked that because uh, in the last few years, I'd been thinking about, you know, gee, where did the impulse to make stuff come from? And it hit me that really where it comes out of more than anything else is uh, that the, we spent the winter in northern Iowa before we moved to Germany. You know, it was just my mom and my grandparents and my brother and I. And in the bedroom that I was in, you know, it was all kinds of Christmas decorations around. And on top of a dresser, they had a shoebox that had a mirror set down in it and then angel hair. Do you remember angel mm -hmm. hair, the mm -hmm. spun glass? And then these Christmas ornaments of houses around it like it was a frozen lake. And 
on the lake were tiny little figures that somehow were in scale with the houses. And I spent hours and hours and hours with that thing. You know, I just loved that miniaturized world, you know, little stuff, you know, that represented big stuff. Right. And uh, that kind of thing was always really fascinating to me. The, you know, the other way you see it, uh, there were a number of older grandpa-aged people in, one was in Manly, Iowa, where my mom's parents were, and the other was in Washington, D.C., and these two guys were model railroad nuts and had really elaborate HO train setups in their basement. And that stuff really fascinated me, you know, because it gets, some of those guys are nuts. Yeah, they'll do every little tree, every little light, everything. Yeah, you know, like buildings with all the furniture on the inside, lights, and it's, it can get really obsessively into the minutia of things. But I always love those things. And, you know, when I think back on it, I think as a kid, the attraction to it is that you're presented with a world that's in a digestible chunk, you know, that you feel like you have some kind of control. I was going to say safety. Yeah, safety and control, you know. And that's the kind of play that you have in those environments is, you know, you're creating scenarios in your head all the time and using that as you know the jumping off point to create a create a world for yourself you think any of that though was when you you know you've got the safe environment and you're in a family that's moving around moving around i'm sure there's i'm sure there's you don't know if you're going to be going you've got all these things that are happening. well yeah it's well like i said it's it's the illusion of control Mm -hmm. over things now so does that affect you how you paint now? Because you paint. I think absolutely big, yeah. that those experiences are the fundamental thing that took me into painting. Now, you know, the irony of that is, you know, as a kid, it's that illusion of control, you know, that you can, you can form your own world and, and order it and order the way that it behaves. But as you get older, you realize, you know, that's not the way that the world works bills. at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not just bills. Yeah, it's no, I know. The that's fundamental, the, the funnel, fundamental way that, that nature works, yeah. you know. It's vast indifference yeah. to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's always going to its most... Uh, uh, l- least organized form anyway so yeah absolutely entropy that's it um, you're gonna be part of that entropy whether you want it or not yeah it's well i'm experiencing that <laughs> we're both experiencing <laughs> that now yeah, all witness did. the hair witness yeah. the hair so when you paint uh, though i do want to get back to your earlier life but when you paint now i see a, contr- a real control sense in your works well i think when you say control i think that well let me just phrase why and the way i see control um from a subject matter point you're you have a range of material you can do a lot of things but there's a range that i would expect to see of the imagery that you like that they're very specific things that i'm attracted to very specific control yeah, I. It's interesting. I had never thought of it that way. Yeah, I suppose there is an aspect of of control in the stuff that gets selected. Yeah. You know, but uh, it gets selected for very specific reasons. You know, uh, one of the things that. Uh, has really hit me over about the last 10 years is that there's a certain type of landscape that I'm really attracted to. And that's where it, where things (laughs) open out. I did it before you even put your hands up because I know. It's uh, is that Iowa? You know, 
actually, the area of Iowa where my family is from is pretty flat. Yeah. Southern Iowa is really hilly. Yeah. It's Grant Wood com- country. Yeah. It's all up and down. But where we're from, it's pretty flat. Uh, I don't know that it's so much that as it's, you know, I'm really attracted to mountain areas. But what I like is those areas, it's like the front range of the Rockies, where you have vast open plain and then, you know, something huge like mountains to give scale to it. Small railroads with a building. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I never paint structures. <laughs> no, I know. I'm going ever, back as ever. a kid in that railroad well, that you're... Well, yeah, you absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I think the thing that's so attractive about that to me is I really like those areas where, you know, subconsciously you have a feeling of all the hugeness of everything that's outside of the picture. You know, it's like, I, lately I've been painting the South Park in Colorado, which is a big, it's an area about 30 by 40 miles, right in the middle of the Rockies. And it's surrounded all the way around with huge mountains, some of them, you know, well over 14,000 feet. And it's, I love getting up in there because you have that scale sense of, you know, people, when you're right on top of those mountains, they look just, you know, compared to a human being, they're gigantic. But you get in that open space up there in that park, and those mountains don't look big at all, you know. And it really gives you a sensation of just how large that sky is. You know, when you see clouds moving through it. Yeah, that's true, because your, your it's, paintings are often two-thirds sky. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the other thing about those kind of spaces is, I mean, for me, subconsciously, you really get the feeling that you were standing on a planet <laughs> that is going round and round. You know, that sky is passing over you. Mm continually and it there's something about that kind of landscape that suggests the hugeness of everything outside of it you think denver was a little bit of that too because absolutely you know people think denver's right in the mountains well no not it's, it's really not. not you can see them in the distance and otherwise and there's real flat denver is very east. much like that the other place it's really like that is hawaii that's one of the reasons why i like hawaii so much in Kauai, primarily or well not? Kauai is the place where I feel it the most. When you go up on the north coast of that island and, you know, above the ocean, it's it's a lot of bluffs here, you know, two or 300 feet above the ocean. And you look out to the north and, you know, it's next stop Japan. Yeah. It's like 4,000 miles of ocean in between. And you really get that kind of discombobulated, holy cow, that's a lot of water out there feeling especially when the surf is really big you know you get that feeling that you are standing in the middle of forces over which you have not the slightest vestige of <laughs> and, control and you don't, over but, anything oh absolutely yeah. but uh, you know it's those kind of spaces where you really have a feeling for the hugeness of things i get that same feeling at mauna kea when I'm yeah, close, absolutely. You know, well, just, you were showing that video last night. Yeah. You know, that's a really humbling experience of, you know, you're flying over and you can see that rift line going all the way up to the crater. This was an image of the, a vo- the volcano when it was blasting. and I took a helicopter right over it and took open door video of it. And it was just mind boggling. Oh, gosh. Uh, it, well, it, it's, it, you, at that moment, you feel humbled that you realize how powerful oh, Mother yeah. Earth is, <laughs> you know, and totally beyond your control. Well, you know, it's one of those really weird places where you have the most primitive forces on the planet right there yeah, present primitive. for you. Mm-hmm. And yet up on the top of the other mountain is you know, some of the best astronomy, you know, yeah. on the planet. In the world. That's right. 
get on Mauna Kea, and it's yeah. which is also another world unto itself. Yeah, it's Getting bizarre up that. there. It's Absolutely just, bizarre. And freezing. well, it's a fourteen thousand foot mountain coming right out of the ocean. <laughs> yeah, no, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's really, really something. It looks like a moon or Mars. Yeah, it's very much there. like the moon. And if those who yeah. haven't gone up, I highly encourage yeah. you get a four wheel drive and go up to the top. Because it's just mind blowing. It really is. Have well, you never painted that? God, that'd be fantastic. No, I could totally, I've never, I've I could never totally painted seen it. you do that. You know, I've thought sometimes as I'm getting older now and running out of time, you know, there's all kinds of paintings that I'd like to make. And there are certain things that really interest me in that respect. Now, telescopes, I think, are just really interesting. You know, just the, the, arc, the functionality of the architecture of them is really strange to me yeah you should go up on one of those either on maui or on the one on maui is really odd too that's the big top secret one oh yeah (laughs) everything's hush hush about that yeah the nsa runs that one so so getting back to kind of your where you got into art so you go to denver and now you're kind of a teenage going through junior high high well really high school at that point right one year of junior high and then all of high school. And, and so how was that with relation to your art? Were you continuing to make art at that point? Did you kind of you see know, a vision for yourself? It yet? did. Well, not really because uh, I got, when I was in junior high, I got bit by the music bug real heavy when we were still in Hawaii. There were people living on our block that actually played in bands and stuff. And I started, you know, buying records and a great time for music. I mean, it was just yeah. going to the PX, <laughs> uh, discovering the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> Is that where you discovered it was a PX in Hawaii? Yeah, yeah. pretty much so, yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, yeah, I got really bitten hard by the music thing. And uh, starting in junior high, I started playing. And what, what instrument? Uh, guitar, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, guitar, drums. Uh-huh. How long was your hair? Uh, when I first got there, shorter yeah. <laughs> than it is now. But yeah. uh, what did your dad think when you kind of went that? Oh, rock and they roll? they were not happy. Yeah, I would think not. They were not happy with the art thing either. Yeah. But, uh, did he fight that hard? Uh, you know, it's funny because he was a Sunday painter, and always enjoyed dabbling in it but uh for me to take it up as a profession i think scared the scared the hell out of him he yeah. just really wasn't wasn't keen on it he, but he sent me to art school so he did so he was he got his dermatology he became a dermatologist yeah and and you said yeah i do want to do this and he sent you there but did you think about uh, music school too at some no point? no i didn't because so that was uh, a phase more or less well kind of uh by the time i got out of high school i the band that i was in had broken up you know we'd done basically what you do in a high school band you know we were fairly successful we played sock hops mm-hmm. all the time yeah. And it was a lot of fun, but the band I was in broke up. And by that point, I'd started to get interested in uh, theater, hmm. uh, oh, techni- yeah, right. technical theater. Yeah. yeah. And uh, was doing that real heavy and did that, you know, for years afterwards. Yeah. So when you went to college, you, but you, when you went to college, you got a degree from the artist. Oh, Institute, yeah. Right? I, art- I went whole hog into the art thing. And yeah. But you became a designer for sets, or tell us about that. Yeah, well, the way that it started was uh, the high school that I was in had a really, really, really good theater program. The guy that was the director there was, you know, in Actors' Equity, and he had his own company outside of teaching at the school. And he'd take kids out of that program and introduce them to professional people around town. You know, so I started getting to do stuff that would that you get paid for, you know, relatively early. And there are a lot of people that went through that program that did, you know, a guy that graduated just a couple years before me that came back and worked in that program, you know, on a paid position afterwards it was uh, John Wells, who became a gigantically successful uh 
television producer and writer. Mm. You know, he, uh, oh, you've seen, he's, he was the executive producer for, his first show was China Beach, and then he did ER, yeah. And yeah, West yeah, Wing, huge. and oh yeah, you know he is. He produced it. Uh, yeah, he was the yeah. executive producer yeah. on those. Yeah, he's David uh, Lynch was David mm -hmm. for West Wing. Oh uh, no, Aaron Sorkin. Aaron Sorkin that's was it, uh, yeah. the main writer on West Wing. Off Law, I think, is Aaron Sorkin's too. Right? Yeah, yeah, Aaron Sorkin's great television writer, but uh, yeah, John went on and did all kinds of stuff. He's directing films now and he's still doing a lot of writing. But he, so what were you doing? What were you, what was your role in those? What, what well, when I first started out doing theater stuff, it was just, you know, whatever was going on, you learn the stagecraft, you know, you learn how you actually put on a show, you know, what, what's involved in it. So you were more on the technical aspect always, of it, right? Yeah. Not, I never, not on stage. I never had any interest in, yeah. in actually participating and being in shows. You like the design, the set, the light. Yeah. I liked the, the creating of the little world, yeah. you know, uh, was always just fascinating to me. And, you know, all of the particulars of of putting on a performance, the ritual of it, you know, it's really, there's just nothing like it. You and you know? did that for eight years? Yeah, I did it. I, when I got out of high school, then I started going to the Art Institute, and then I'd work theater-related jobs in the summertime. And uh, when I got out of art school, it was really the only marketable skill that I had. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I got a job with a with a company that was a drop rental house, and I designed packages of scenery. This was in Kansas City, or this is in Kansas City. Yeah, and I worked for them for years. Uh, and what would I, you do? Well, the way drop rental houses work is, at any given time in the United States, there are literally thousands of high schools and community theaters, small colleges that are doing productions of this or that. And, you know, there are all the standards, especially in musical theater. You know, there's the canon of, of stuff that everybody does. Right. And one of the problems that groups like that run into is that it's very expensive to put together a really good set, set of scenery especially for musicals, because you know, a lot of the time there's four or five different settings for it. So what a drop rental house does is you design, I design wing and drop packages where you have, you know, you'll have a proscenium and then you have wings that are usually dimensional. They're, you know, partially painted and then cut out and supported with netting. And you'll have sometimes two or three of those and then a backdrop at the back of it. So you have a complete set of scenery for that scene. And, you know, it's all hang, hung on battens and flown in and out. So you would design, a, paint? I would design and paint the whole whack. So, you know, all those musical theater war horses. You know, Guys and Dolls, West Side Story, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. you know, The Music Man, all of those. I've I was painted. in The Music Man. You may have provided that. I'm from Mason City, <laughs> which is where Meredith Wilson is was one from. of the little kids in The Music Man when I did yeah. that, but in, uh, you know, college theater. So were you painting or doing anything, you know, related to You know, to our, when I got out, of, well, when I got out of art school, I was working you know, as a set designer and, you know, painting scenery uh, to make money. And uh, when I was in art school, there were a number of friends that I had. That was a time in art school where there were bands coming out of art schools, you know, some really good bands like Talking Heads. Those guys all went to RISD, you know, the Rhode Island School of Design. And, you know, most art schools had at least a band or two and the Art Institute was no different. And uh, I had friends that were in those bands. And the thing that was really interesting about it to me was that 
the idea of you know when I was in bands when I was in high school it was always cover bands who were always playing other people's music and the idea of writing music was completely alien to me I was like oh no that's something that those up Real band. in Valhalla yeah. do yeah. and uh, you know in art school and with the whole thing with punk rock and art school bands you know there was this real do-it-yourself aesthetic to it of people saying oh you know I can do this too and when I got out of school I started doing music again really seriously and did that you know, and as far as art activities go, it was music more than anything. Playing uh, in a band, or I had a band. I was mostly interested in songwriting, though. You know, it was always really interesting to me. And as time went on, uh, the band never went anywhere. But I had a songwriting partnership with a guy that was in a fairly successful band, and uh, we wrote together for a while. And I did that right up until I got married in 1987. And at that point, I was 29 years old. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm getting a little bit too old for this. And decided to pull the plug on it and go back to painting. And at that time frame, so you were working in the band writing songs. You were also doing the art design as, to make yeah, some and, money. Yeah, and still making some art. Yeah. You know, I, I did quite a bit of art the first about a year and a half that I got out of school, and then... Was this figurative? What was it? It was always figurative stuff, yeah. yeah. I thought that's what you did earlier. Yeah. yeah, very much so. I always really liked figurative work. And when did you switch over to doing landscape? Well, that was kind of inadvertent. Uh, when, after I got married, I started art making, you know, I always figured if I was working I, I would have enough time to do music or painting, but, but not, not enough for both. And, you know, the kind of work that I was doing, you know, I always tell kids as they're coming up, the most important thing you need to do is you need to develop the drawing skills. Because if you can draw, then there are dozens and dozens of applications for that skill. And do you think that requires going to art school? Uh, I think it's really helpful, but you got to pick the right school. I mean, I have seen people that have been through four years of art school that can't draw their way out of a paper bag. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to seek out that kind of training, you know, because it's not emphasized. You know, the physical, the physical skill thing of learning how to draw is not valued like it used to be. Right. I mean, you can get. Well, there's a lot of very famous people that don't touch their hands on anything that goes out with their name on it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. You know, or you have uh, people like Paul McCartney who can't read music. Well, he can now. He says he can't. <laughs> <laughs> Though, of course, he is fantastic. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, he's beyond the... You know, it's funny that you bring him up because, you know, I think a lot of the time about, you know, differing times have differing art forms that prevail in them and uh, you know to me everything past you know really the 20th century the two big forms that are the most successful or I think the best stuff has been done are you know it's not visual art or music or uh, you know regular what I would consider to be serious you know, they say classical, but it's not really classical. I mean, serious, you know, orche orchestral music. Mm -hmm. The stuff that really has stuck and had made an impact, and I think is really some of the best stuff out there, is all in film and music. Yeah, it does you go know. together. Uh, you know, I would, personally, I'd put the Beatles up there against anything. I mean, if I were going to a desert island and i had a choice of okay well <laughs> you know you can have the pick out any de Kooning yeah. you want or you can get you know the box set of everything the beatles recorded you know in a good stereo yeah. i know what i'm going yeah. with you know <laughs> and i've heard all that music you know yeah. thousands and thousands of times but it's still well you could also make your own art you could build your well own yeah sets there's of, always that little sets of yeah <laughs> exactly <desert> scenes <laughs> 
You know, he's a good painter too. Paul McCartney's a, actually a very, very, very competent artist. Yeah. He could have probably done that easily as a profession. Well, you know, those guys to me, there's something that's really, truly transcendent about that stuff. I mean, it, it gets across in a way. I mean, the thing that is continually frustrating to me is, you know, I've looked at a lot of art and studied art history in some depth. And, you know, a lot of the modernist stuff just doesn't, it just doesn't do anything for me. It gets into the realm of the toolbox for me. You know, it's like, oh my, look at my planer. Yeah. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it a pure thing, the shavings as it comes off? Yeah. And but to be specific, you love people like de Kooning, Rothko, oh, Agnes Martin. Yeah, now, you know, de Kooning, Joseph Alvarez. Yeah. You're talking more I'm installational, no, yeah, conceptual well, you know, art. Even, even some of the best painting that I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, when I think about art history, you know, what, what delineates success in an artist? You know, to me, it's, does it really help clarify what it's like to be alive, you know, at any given time? Emotion. Does it, does it provide insight into, you know, all of those basic struggles that people yeah. have to engage in? Yeah. You know, and for me, you know, the comparison, say, take a guy like de Kooning and, put it up against, you know, like Leonardo da Vinci. You know, da Vinci didn't do that many paintings. I think, right. what, there were 25 of them out there that people know about. And, uh, you know, as far as a qualitative evaluation, I mean, certainly it's subjective to a certain point, but, you know, in my mind, there's no doubt that da Vinci is miles beyond anything de Kooning ever did. And price-wise, if you went by that, by the auction house, they would say, you agree, since one just sold for... 400 million well you know what people value as far as putting money down uh, you know it's always interesting to see how those decisions get made but uh, I mean I just think about like you really take a good look at Virgin of the Rocks and you know it's just layer upon layer upon layer of depth and meaning and you know it transcends the cultural con context of when it was made mm. i mean people are fundamentally different now than when that painting was made yet it still connects yeah that's still current and there's also the the more ephemeral aspect of it's it's a handmade object you know i i had an experience oh this was god coming up on 20 years ago a guy that i knew that was an art critic and uh the guy was a dazzling intellect i mean broadly deeply read and extremely intimidating and uh i would have conversations with him and always felt just you know on tinter hooks because <laughs> you know the depth of the knowledge right. was he was more deeply read than I was and it was extremely intimidating and until <laughs> one day I was having a conversation with him and somehow Leonardo da Vinci had come up and I was talking about that you know the the tactile quality of you know it's a he's making handmade objects and you know just the look and the feel of the way that the paint is applied uh and he he said to me oh jeffrey surely you understand that anybody can paint like leonardo uh -huh. it's uh -huh. it's the intellectual content of it that makes it great that shows he wasn't an artist well <laughs> it was at that moment that i said in my own head this guy 
he knows a lot of stuff, but about painting, he's utterly and completely full of shit. Yeah. He has no idea yeah. what he just said. Yeah, he hasn't painted. Well, you know, I know for a fact that there may be, maybe in 7 billion people, maybe two or three human beings on the face of the planet right now that are even capable of making the marks in a painting like Virgin yeah. of the Rocks. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's a level, it's a skill level that is, well, you know, it's, it's like, like anything. I think it's like Einstein in mathematics. Well, yeah. You know, or Bach in music, or you take your pick, whether it's an athlete, you know, it's a Seth Curry that can hit a three pointer. Oh, every yeah, time. I know. I mean, the the people know. that are at the tip top yeah. of skills and professions that require true physical control yeah. of what they're doing. Gifted. And I, I yeah, and I mean, that's an argument that I have in my own head all the time is what are these differences between, you know, how important is facility in a thing? I think it's important. Yeah, to a certain extent, but, you know, then other side of the coin, I can think of, you know, a painter like Van Gogh, you know, not very facile. You in know. color sense, I would say. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, in terms no, of... No, that's true. But I know, think color sense is also a facility. Yeah, it's a different form. Hours. It's a different form of facility. Yeah. I'm talking about, you know... You're talking about hand-eye coordination more. I'm talking about rendering and draftsmanship. Yeah. You know, a guy like, say, Thomas Aikens yes. versus, <laughs> versus a guy like Van Gogh. I mean, yeah. no, yes, Aikens... Yeah. is in complete control yeah. as a draftsman. Yeah. I mean, he can, if you say... His surgery painting was one of the greatest ever. Oh, yeah. yeah. Draw <laughs> a shoe, you know, yeah. you're going to get two different looking yeah. shoes from yeah. those two guys. And one is one's what I would call... a clown shoe and one's another one. Well, you know, one you would consider more facile. Yeah. You know, it's, more, it's more exacting. Yeah. I look at it more as a hand-eye coordination but kind of a... I think you you hit the nail on the head when you say facile in terms of sensitivity to color, yeah. emotionally facile. Exactly. You know, And that can also be in sculpture where you see individuals who can put these three-dimensional things together. That is, how do they see that even? Yeah. yeah. You know, sometimes you get painters that are just gronky as hell that it seems like they have very little actual control over their marks and, and what their hand is doing, yet it is powerful. Mm. You know, yeah. it's good. Uh, and I'm always kind of back and forth with that stuff, you know, because I love, you know, the more gestural painterly quality and things, but I don't particularly paint that way myself. No. You know, people always say to me, oh, well, you know, Gosh, your work looks just like a photograph. And do you want to throw up every now and then? Well, you know, I understand yeah. where they're coming from with it because it's, you know, I am from the age of the photograph. Yeah. You know, photographic imagery is completely integrated into my perception. You know, I had a teacher in the Art Institute and you know, he was always saying, oh, you have to observe nature, you know, nature, 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 nature. Mm -hmm. And you look at his paintings, and this guy was named Wilbur Ewald. I, as of this point, I believe that he's still alive. I hated his painting when I was in school, but as I've gotten older, I've come to just, you know, the guy is just a titan. He's really, really, really good. But... You know, he's, he says, I'm observing nature, but the things are not natural at all. There's nothing natural about them. When you get down to the brass tacks of, okay, what's natural? You know, he's going out. He loves to paint landscape, and he goes out, and he'll work on a painting for, you know, three or four months. So, yeah, you're observing nature, but observing what exactly in nature? You know, because right. I know for a fact the cloud cover on every one of those days is going to be different. Every one of those hours. So what he's really painting is, yes, it's nature, but it's an amalgam of yeah. nature. There's nothing 
specific i mean and he's just like me you know he doesn't put cars in his paintings there's no people there's you know he's <laughs> things are going by the wayside all the time but it's a it, it's an amalgam of the experience of sitting there and observing the thing and you know i think that's a valuable thing to do it's not what i'm inclined to do but i'm really glad that he's doing it you know but uh, you know it's you know well back to photography you know it's the big difference between him and me, I had a conversation with him one time out at a restaurant and he was saying, oh, well, you have to, you need to paint a still life. You need to do this. You need to do that. And I finally said to him, Wilbur, you know, this, you're telling me that I need to do these things, but the reality is you need to do these things because yeah. these things that you're describing are uh, complete anathema to me yeah they don't have any they're meaning. anachronistic yeah i said i'll bet you can remember a time when there was no television oh certainly i can on and on hmm. i said i can't look i can't my perception i mean when i dream there are cinematic qualities yeah. to how i dream you know that are informed by Camera position and cutting and all that stuff leaches into you, right. you know, and photographic sensibility is completely integrated into everything. It's interesting, into you everybody. know, in fact, you say that because I could see your paintings easily being the background of many, many uh, movies or shows. I mean, they just definitely, I never thought of it. They have term, that kind of cinematic sure, quality. They definitely too. do, especially some of those big skies, lonely areas. That could be wonderful to see a whole movie done just with your paintings in the background. Well, I tend to really love films that have that kind of painterly quality. One of my favorite movies of all time is uh, Night of the Hunter, mm. that uh, Robert Mitchum, mm, where movie. he plays the guy with love and hate on his knuckles. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Charles Lawton directed it. Oh, yeah. He, he, guy, the Hunchback of Notre yeah, Dame. Yeah, no, I was going to say he's a good actor. Great actor and really good director. And the thing that's so interesting about that movie is it was all shot on soundstage. Mm -hmm. So all of the settings are just completely controlled. Mm -hmm. And it has the most interior dreamlike quality to it. It is... It just seeps into you. Another movie that's like that is To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. You know, the, all that stuff with, you know, Jim and Scout yeah. in the woods, you know, and she's dressed as a ham. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, my fa I mean, I think the Coen brothers have a sensibility. They have a sensibility. Just, just, oh, my God. Name the movie and it's there. Yeah. They are really something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Fargo wouldn't be Fargo without that austereness. Yeah, absolutely. You know. It really gets the feel of it. The other one like that that I was thinking of is uh, you know, Girl with the Gra Dragon Tattoo. Yeah. I saw the Swedish version of it and didn't really care for it. Yeah, I saw that one as well. Uh, and then I saw the David Fincher version yeah. of it, and the atmosphere yeah. of it was... All that stuff with the car yeah. going through the snowy <laughs> landscape up to the sort of creepy house and the middle of nowhere in Sweden and it's gray and snowing yeah. and it's uh, wow. <laughs> you know? it sets, setting can make mood. I mean, yeah, it does. absolutely, positively. Yeah, and and I feel those in your your paintings too. When I look at them, that one painting of the trees, you know. Yeah, There's some kind. Of, I find that to be, and this is a painting that's just, it's a vertical painting with lots of uh, pine, some kind of trees. I don't know what they Good are. Pines. Yeah, and just a little bit of uh, pink clouds in the background. And in the foreground, there's like a, almost like a little line of fog that's made its way through. Yeah, and it's it's a, it's a real, it has a very dreamy kind of uh, feel. It's much more interior, you know, in, in the head yeah. kind of painting than... Uh, what I normally do, you know, but that, I mean, to me, there are, there are very specific types of landscape painting, you know, and that, you know, you have vistas, you have glades, and you have grottos, 
there's really only three fundamental types of composition for landscape painting. You know, vistas, everything opened out. You know, it's the individual identity in the context of the hugeness of nature. Uh, glades, always trees, you know, which are often, you know, surrogates for human form. That's mm -hmm. why a tree has a trunk, you mm -hmm. know, just like a man has a trunk. You know, guys, I think of, in that context, Corot, all of those mm -hmm. landscapes that he did with nudes in them, where it's, it's about realizing commonality with nature or processes in nature, you know, relationship to it. And it starts to move more interior, and then you have what I call grottos, which is enclosed interior space. And that's guys like, you know, Odillon Redon, uh, Gustave Moreau, uh, you know, Arnold Bachlin, all, all of those symbolist painters. A lot of the time, mm -hmm. very enclosed. Piranesi mm -hmm. is like that, although they're architectural spaces, but it's. It's a completely psychologically interior space, you know, and that's, you know, the world of, of the mystic, you know, of you go to sleep and you go into that kind of space where knowledge from elsewhere yeah, seeps, in. seeps into you, you know. So when you do a tree painting like that, which I think is kind of out of your n norm. What inspires something like that? Or is there inspiration in that? It, often those things have a super, super, super long gestation period. Are we talking years? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I have some paintings that I've done that you'll see something, uh, you know, for me, my memory is very visually triggered and you see something and it really sticks with you and it permeates in and you find that you know there's something about it that you know you'll dream about or it pops into your head at times when you're not expecting it that for me I try to pay attention to that stuff because I think there's potency mm -hmm. in it you know it sticks with you for a reason and you know, a lot of the time I'll just, hey, God, you know, I should really make a painting of that. But it takes a long time for it to gel and to, to actually, so you're actually able to physically execute the thing with some sort of a semblance of the feeling of, you know, what you've been having as the thing enters your mind. And do you wake up and go, hey, I'm going to every once in a while, yeah. you know, especially as I get older, you know, I'm making more and more stuff for my, just for myself these mm -hmm. days, you know, paintings that I would never expect to be able to sell. Mm -hmm. uh, but you just make it because you feel a need to, you know. And when you make something like this painting and you and it's a very successful painting, do you at that point go, okay, I'm done with that imagery and I don't need to revisit it? Or if it was so successful, you go, I think I need to do more. Well, you know, it just depends. You know, sometimes sometimes you get it out and it's just gone and you're not thinking about it anymore. But sometimes it's not or you're dissatisfied in some way. You know, you think it can be improved upon. Uh, and normally, you know, in the past, I have not really thought about stuff like that. You know, normally when I finish a thing, it's okay. I'm done. You know, right. and I'm a professional. Gets, I'm on to the next. It gets framed and crated, and it's out the door, right. and I never see it again. And it that doesn't bother me at all. You know, uh, but there are some things that I make that hang around for years and years and years. Like if you come to my studio. You'll see paintings from you know thirty years ago that you liked, and you just said, well, "I'm going to keep hang on to this for a yeah, while." Yeah, well, and there's also ones that you don't like. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that you go, "I don't want this out, but I don't want to destroy it at this point." Yeah, and you know, destroying work is a weird thing. You know, I find it difficult to do. Uh, and why is that? You think? I think it, for me, it's partially you hold it back because you think there may be a time when you can, like 
just in the last, say, six or seven years, uh, you know, having painted for so long, you know, you start to accumulate stuff that you're not really sure about, you know. And that's not a lot of stuff for me, but I always have, like, if I do 50 or 60 paintings in a year, there may be two or three of them that I'm, you know, just not comfortable with. And I'll leave them out, you know, or stuff that hasn't sold, you know, over a long period of time and end up back in the studio. And you have that kind of stuff around and just in the last six or seven years, uh, every once in a while I'll get one out and say, well, you know, it doesn't matter what I do to this. I'm just going to do something radically different with it. And, you know, if I can turn it into something, great. And if I don't, then who cares, you know? There's and so the, you'll modify what you painted or? Yeah, I'll just start going right over the top of the thing and, you know, completely repaint a whole painting, you know, just to see what happens, you yeah. know? And, and what, ha what happens sometimes is that? Sometimes you come up with something that's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's a, that sort of stuff for me is, it's a lot more subjective, you know? It's, I may be getting, find something that I'm really liking in it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to translate to yeah. sales. Yeah, I see that all the time, actually, as a gallerist. Yeah. Some of my most favorite paintings, i.e. your tree painting, which is different than your subject matter you do, immediately I go, oh my God, I love this painting. It's genius. I don't know if it's going to sell easily or not. Yeah, you never know. I love it. And Yeah, I've done, I've done some paintings like that that were, like I went through a period where I was starting to think, you know, the work has been getting had been getting more and more refined looking. The the drawing had gotten more particular mm -hmm. in it, and I found myself thinking one day, you know, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, there was a much more gestural, brushy quality to the stuff that I was doing, you know. And there was a rawness to it that I liked uh, that had gradually been dissipating, you know, things have been getting more specific. And I thought, you know, what can I do that would actually force me into those kind of faster decision-making process when putting paint on? And I started painting with encaustics which is, you know, it's melted wax. It's all it is is beeswax with mm -hmm. pigment in it. And I had a, I had two pancake griddles with muffin tins on it and started painting with these things. And it was so interesting because, you know, first of all, your brush is hard, so you had to melt it on the griddle, mm -hmm. clear whatever wax is left on there. And you mix your color and either you lift it out of the tin or off the griddle, which you can use as a palette to keep it melted. And you have approximately maybe three at the outside, four seconds to make a decision of where you're going to put it. Mm. And it forces your hand, forces your hand and you have to get more gestural. It, things have to be less specific. You have to, there are trade-offs, you know, the marks are more expressive, but they're less specific, you know, and God, I worked with that stuff and I just loved painting with it. And, uh, and some of those qualities started going back into the work. And, uh, you know, I did probably 20, 25 paintings like that because they go fast. You mm -hmm. have to work fast. Right. And, uh, was very excited about them and, got a bunch framed out and sent them out and I could not sell them. Was it color wise you think? It no, it was not color. It was the rawness the of it was the rawness of the mark making. Uh, you know, it was the lack of specificity. Do you still have okay. those? Yeah, I I'd do. like to see images if you would send me Yeah, they I did a number of them that I thought were quite successful. I'd like to see those actually. Uh but, you know, it's a thing that happens with professional painters is, you know, in, in some ways it's a good thing, in some ways it's a bad thing. Like a guy like Corot, 
you know, who is one of my all-time favorite painters. But, you know, he was engaged in a commercial enterprise. You know, this guy was painting for a living. And there were certain expectations about what a Corot painting was yes, like. Right. And, you know, he could make those paintings beautifully. And I believe me, I would be very happy to have one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there are... There are pressures exerted, you know, the older you get as an artist, there are expectations of what your what your work looks like. Yes, very you much know, so. And, you know, in some ways that's constraining, and in other ways it's, you know, it is what it is. It's what you, what you are, right. what you developed into. And, you know, I think about some of my favorite painting, painters and, you know, Generally, most of them didn't get good until they hit middle age, and a lot of the time it's a very late stuff that is, you know, when they really have a solid idea of who they are and what they're about. Like yeah. that, like Giorgio Morandi, mm-hmm. you know, those, and that guy paints, I mean, and he, it was, he was always a Giorgio Morandi, but I mean, yeah. They he didn't get someone. bad when he yeah. got old. Well, I think Ed Mel is one of those guys that's really just keeps getting better and better. I just, uh, you know, well, he's I think freer. That you know? Yeah, I think that happens. Dixon did uh, the same thing. He started, you know, getting rid of the extraneous stuff that he didn't need at the end. Well, that, you know, we were talking earlier when we were in the car today about, uh, you know, hitting 60 years old. And for me, probably the, the most salient point about those kinds of markers is you know the one thing that I am constantly conscious of now is geez you're running out of time yeah you know and right how much more can I all pay? the yeah. you know bullshit starts <laughs> flying yeah. out the window uh-huh. it's like oh do I really have time for this uh no see ya yeah <laughs> you know? yeah it's true it's freeing in some respects I think yeah, yeah so yeah I you know, there's always been a reductive quality in, to what I do, you know, where I'm constantly eliminating things out of it, you know, that I don't, that just seem distracting. Yeah, I think it's, me. painters have to learn that to, to some extent. And I see it in younger painters often, they're trying to throw in everything they can. Yeah, you the know, kitchen sink. Yeah, you know, yeah. let's have the rainbow, the birds, and you know, everything. Okay, get rid of the rainbow, get rid of the birds. Do like you did in your one painting where you have a huge landscape, a cloud, and a single sun that's penetrating through it. That's all you need. Yeah, where you, know? you just let <laughs> everything else go. Yeah, just know. let it all go. And it'll all, you know, sublime is it's very powerful. Well, yeah, I mean, austere, sublime, you know. For me, a big aspect of the sublime is uh, surrender in front of hugeness, you know, that, you know, we were, that's a thing that I run into sometimes, like at openings, uh, that will, I'll meet people, you mm-hmm. know, that are coming to see the work and they'll say, oh, you know, God, it's just so beautiful. And, mm-hmm. and then you do something that, you know, because I am attracted to painting some stuff that's, uh, you know, like weather. I love weather. You know? Yeah. Thunderstorms, uh, you know, extreme. Your that's, supercell. You did a supercell in this, huh? You, you know, and you really captured it. You know, that to me is, it's part of what makes nature sublime is that it's, it's scary. Yeah. You know? It's, uh, it's beautiful, but it's horrifying, yeah. too. I, I saw one one time and felt all those emotions. And then I turned my car around, because it was an east of Amarillo, and said, I don't think we should go through that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I was glad. There was like 14 or 15 tornadoes where we would have gone right through it. Uh, you could just tell it. You could see it in the colors, in the sensibilities. Even though where I was, it was on the side of it where there wasn't the, you know, the horrificness, it, but yeah, it's, the it, power going in uh, was, ooh. And uh, what, why did you choose to do that little painting of a supercell? 
Uh, just because I think it's, for starters, it's visually just so stunning and out of the ordinary. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's also because it's gigantic and s- scary. Yeah. And, you know. Would you do that large ever? Because that's a commitment. Oh, I, I, have, I have done, you know, I've painted a lot of tornadoes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've seen that. I used to, I used to buy tornado videos and I had a big TV screen and a really good freeze frame on my uh, my video player and I just watch them and go stop (laughs) and make a painting yeah (laughs) so you could use it as a reference yeah exactly yeah Uh, yeah, that kind of stuff is endlessly fascinating for me you know, and it's, to me, a part of the picture. You know, if you like, you know, people tend to be attracted to my work because they, you know, I like those times of day where everything is in high transition, you know, where the color is more high key, where the light is more extreme. Uh, but, you know, I, I also, I like the stuff that's memorable, you know, and a huge part of nature is that it's gigantic and awe inspiring and horrifying sometimes. Yeah. Whether it's water, whether it's clouds, fire, all those things. Well, you know, you were showing me that video, you know, part of, of the volcano, volcano, that big rift opening up, you know, all the way up the mountain there. And, a big part of the appeal of that is it, it's horrifying. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a thousand cows is gone. Yeah. If you get in the way of that, good luck. Yeah. No, it's it's insane. The power. Yeah, and yeah. there's you should paint. Have you painted a volcano, by the way? That would be a fascinating painting for you. No, right? I haven't. Yeah. But it's funny that you bring it up. I'm going to send you uh, some images. <laughs> you know, my dad uh, just passed, and uh, you know, was saying that he was a Sunday painter. I have a, a few of his paintings but one of them is a, a volcano yeah. in hawaii yeah because that's a tough that's a tough subject matter to try to take on yeah it's pretty yeah it's pretty daunting trying to get something like that because it's yeah no trying to that's, capture that's that. biting off a big uh-huh. Uh-huh. a big chunk <laughs> of something there <laughs> Well, we've bit off a big chunk of something here, too. Believe it or not, we've already gone over an hour. Oh, geez, Louise. Yeah, right. no, yeah. Just, great yeah. conversation, Mark. Yeah, no, it's always fun. Questions. One of my favorite things with you was when we have a show together, and we don't have, all, have them enough, but it's just the time I get to spend with you oh. to talk. You know, one of the most interesting things in having you is, you know, as a dealer for me is, uh, you know, I knew you for years and then I found out, oh, gee, Mark's writing these books. <laughs> and he gave me a couple of the books and I took them home and went, you know, I just love these things. <laughs> They're like, God, the stories are just so interesting to me. And it triggered, you know, we actually started talking more about this kind of stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, finding, Common ground. Common ground and similar interests. And, you know, your interests are a lot broader than, you know, just contemporary Western art. Oh, yeah. You know, you're, you're looking at a lot of different stuff and, yeah, a lot of common ground. So. Yeah. Well, I think one of the fun things was when you can find an artist as a gallerist who um, not only you appreciate their art um, and get it, but you also like the person. And Jeff Haling. I like you. <laughs> Mark, I like you too. We'll, we'll meet again just to, to go have a well a, a dinner maybe in Denver sometime when you're over yeah, there. It's been one of the really nice things is, you know, we've turned into bros yeah, over the years. Yeah. So. It happens if you represent people long enough, you know, uh, that you it becomes at a different level of commitment. Yeah, you yeah. start to really yeah, to understand some stuff about the other person, you That's know, right. which is really great. Right. Great. All right. Thank you, Thank my you, sir. All right. Our dealer diaries. Jeff Ailing, a fantastic artist and a very interesting human being. Well, thanks, Mark. Yep. Man Gallery, located for over 26 years in Tucson, Arizona. 
specializing in antique Native American art, early Western art, including the famed Maynard Dixon, as well as modern art. You can find everything online at medicinemangallery.com. There's over 6,000 objects to select from. Also, the Charles Bloom Murder Mystery Series, written by yours truly, me, Mark Sublett. There's six books in this series, and they follow the protagonist Charles Bloom through all the intrigue of the art world set in Santa Fe and the Navajo Nation. These can be found on Audible, eBooks, Amazon, and of course, the gallery at medicinemangallery.com.